Praise God. Awesome. Well, today, just like with Mother's Day, I've asked two generations, two separate generations to speak uh, for 15 minutes each on Father's and Father's Day. And so from a generation that's a little bit ahead of mine, I'm going to ask Pastor Tom to come and bring us a word today, a, sh a short 15-minute inspirational word for Father's Day, and then he will be followed by a younger generation than me, and that is Pastor Steve. So let's give Pastor Tom a warm welcome as he comes forward. Thank you, Pastor Tom. I love you. You know, this man spends most of his work day making calls around the church to all of you. It is very important to me as a pastor that we shepherd our people. And so it's not good enough for me that you show up to church. We want to be in contact. And so this man is my voice often on the phone reaching out to you and saying hello and asking you if you need prayer. And thank you, Pastor Tom, for doing that so well. Amen. Come. Testing. Hello. Hi, everybody. I don't get up here very often, do I? I'm usually making those calls or counseling or visiting or all sorts of things. Thank you, Pastor. I had to bring it up because I like gadgets. Most of us guys like gadgets, don't we? Um, let me get my notes here in, in order. So good morning. good morning, happy Father's Day. Um, I'm honored to be up here. Um, so what is a father? A father is someone who carries pictures in his wallet where his money used to be. <laughs> Had Carlos been here, Pastor Carlos been here, I would have asked him to show everybody his wallet. It's about this thick, full of pictures, no money full of pictures. <laughs> Have any of you ever agonized over finding a gift for a father or your dad? Oh yeah, sometimes it's hard, but you know it's never hard. Why? Because most guys will be very satisfied if they just get a little respect from their family and have a really nice sharp pocket knife. <laughs> really, it doesn't take that much to make us happy. But now that we've got a pocket knife and a flashlight, we're ahead of the game. Someone once asked some someone asked a young boy, "What is Father's Day?" He said, "It's just like Mother's Day, except you don't spend as much money." <laughs> that was for you women, okay? You realize that? Okay, we spend much more money on you. And it's necessary. So, let me ask you a question. Has anybody in here ever felt far from God? I expect every hand, okay? We've all felt far from God from time to time. Well, if you felt far from God, guess who moved? You did. I did. We moved away from God. God is here. We moved away. All of a sudden, we realized things aren't going as well. Things aren't happening the right way. And we need to come back to God. And there's a verse that you can put in your billfold, in your pocket, in your purse, and keep it with you because it's so important. And it's 4.8 of, of James Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. That's all I wanted in that. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Now who moves first? 
we do. Why? Because we're the ones who moved. So if we draw near to God, he will draw near to us. How long does that take? That fast. Okay? You need to start talking to him. You need to start praying. You need to start reading his word. And you will be back so fast if you allow yourself to do that. You can be back with God immediately. So don't ever worry about being far from God. You can come back anytime you want. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. So important. Now, I remember when I first became a dad. My daughter Katie was being born, and we're in the operating room, and I have my arm around my my wife, and I'm coaching her, <laughs> you know? I'm, I'm coaching her through this. And Katie gets born. Katie, Katie comes out of the canal, and they need to cut the umbilical cord, and they told me ahead of time, I'm gonna do it. So they, I've got my right arm around her, and they give me the scissors in my left hand. I'm right-handed. I'm not very good with my left hand. And I don't know if you all know this. This might be new information for some. The umbilical cord is very, very tough. It's very tough. I slipped off that with my left hand with those scissors three times. The doctor said, do it or I'm going to. So I took my arm away from my wife and I put it in my right hand and snipped it. The, the nurse put a clamp on the umbilical cord, wrapped Katie up, and handed her to me. Now I'm standing next to my wife, she's getting doctored up, and, and I've got this baby in my hands. And I'm looking into this beautiful face. I'm 28 years old, and I didn't know the Lord. I, it was, I was two years away from finding him, but this event meant so much to me. And it changed my life. I'm looking into the face of my daughter. And I realize I'm a dad. I helped to create this person. This human being is mine. And it just flashed into my head. This is how God loves you. And I started teetering. I started started. Moving back and forth, the nurse grabbed me and threw me into a chair because she knew I was going out. But I'm still holding this baby. And it was one of the best experiences of my life. It defined who I was. And I heard from God. I had never heard from God before. But I knew this was how he loved me. I would do anything for this child. And I'd only known for her for a minute. Yeah. And yet, I loved her that much. And that's how he feels about us. Amen. He loves us so much. Yeah. Each one of us. He loves us so much. Yeah. She was 8 pounds, 1 ounce, 22 inches long. I was 28 and about 6 foot tall at that time. <laughs> okay? It made such a difference in my life. It really did. What an experience that was. Now we can, we can today honor our father, honor, our, honor ourselves as being fathers, and honor our heavenly father. So Father's Day is for everybody here. Okay? Uh, I, just a little short story. We used to, uh, when I was a young boy, we would ask our dad, my dad, what would you like for Father's Day? He said, I'd like to be with my family. Thank you. I want you all to be here all day long. I want you to spend the day with me. And we'd say, Dad, no, no, what, what do you want us to do? And he said, and that's why I brought this up here. He said, let's go play golf. And he wore a hat like this. My dad loved to golf. And he was never very good at it. <laughs> he just, 
he just never did get very good. Uh, I was the star golfer in the, in the household. But my dad loved it more than anybody I ever knew. He loved to play golf. And we would be, we'd be playing on the golf course, and at some point, dad would stop. And he did this, I think, every time he played. But he would look around. And my dad never had much money. But a golf course is primped and sculpted, and every grass blade of grass is cut the precise way, and it's so beautiful. There's, he, he used to say there's not a more beautiful place in the whole world than a golf course. But he would stop playing for a minute, look around, and he'd always say, isn't this lovely? My dad didn't use words like that very often. In fact, he didn't know any Christianese. He was a Christian, but he didn't speak the way we speak today. He was a tough sergeant from the army, and, and uh, he was not used to saying the word lovely, but he had to use it on a golf course. He just loved being there. And I can imagine 32 years ago when he passed away and went to heaven, he looked around. And then he looked Jesus in the eyes and said, isn't this lovely? And he's been saying it ever since. He was a good man. He wanted us to spend time with him. He wanted us to spend the whole day with him. And another thing he loved was ask him questions, ask him his advice. He loved to sit down with us and explain things to us. He had so much more wisdom than we did. Well, let's move on to number two, being honored as a father. Of course, when, when we uh, had Father's Day, when I had a family, had the kids around, they would say, what do you want to do? And I'd say, just like my dad, I would say, I want you to be with me. So... I had my whole family with, with me on Father's Day. And then they'd say, what would you like to do? And usually the first thing out of my mouth was, was let's go golfing. <laughs> or boating, or swimming, or hiking, or go to any sports event there is. I had a lot of different things that I liked to do. But sometimes we would go golfing. And this is the kind of hat I usually wore. But I also, just like my dad, loved it when my kids would come to me and sit on my lap and ask me, an, and ask me a question or some advice. I remember when my son came to me one time and it was a, an advice about money. And he was so confused as to what to do. And five minutes and he had the answer. That made me feel so great. And I really don't think I came up with an answer. I think he did, but just needed to sit down and talk about it. But it was so great that he wanted to get my advice. Our Heavenly Father also wants to spend time with us. The, our Heavenly Father wants us to spend time with him every day. Now, how do we do that? Again, like I said before, prayer, talking to him. It's so important. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18 tells us something, and I know it's not up on the board. No, it's not. Um, the first verse, 16, is only two words. There's very few scriptures that are two words only. Rejoice always. Rejoice always. What does that mean to you? To me, it means be happy. If you're rejoicing always, you're happy. So here's God telling you, be happy. And then like so many of the verses in the Bible, it tells us how to be happy. The very next verse. Pray without ceasing. Three words. So be happy. Pray without ceasing. Communicate with me, says God. Talk to me. Include me in your plans. Keep me with you. Spend time with me. Pray without ceasing. 
And then it says, just a minute, because I want to get this right. It's in Thessalonians. In everything, give thanks. Four words. So two words, three words, and four words. Be happy. Communicate with God. In everything, be thankful. We need to have an attitude of thankfulness to God because he has given us everything. He has given us a plan that nobody could have ever figured out except him. And it works. And we can all come to him at any time. Because then it goes on to say, to finish that, that verse, this is God's will for you. Each one of us. This is our godly will for this life. When we go to heaven, we're going to have it all. But while we're here, let's be happy. Let's pray without ceasing. Let's keep God in our plans for everything. And let's always be thankful because it's because of his love for us that we can have a good life while we're here. And that's what he wants. That's his desire for us. Now, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. I love this verse because we don't have to figure it out. We don't have to come up with the right answers. God's got the right answers. We're supposed to trust. Trust is what we need to do. And not just a little bit, with everything in us, all your heart. In the Greek and the Hebrew, all means all. All your heart. So if we do that, and going on, in all your ways, acknowledge him. In other words, everything you do, keep him with you. Keep him informed. Talk with him while you're doing everything else. Acknowledge him, and he, God, will make your path straight. He, God, will give you a good life. He will honor you by making fullness a part of who you are. You will find that your life is full. Why? because you included him in everything. And it's so important for us to realize that. One more verse and I'm all done. Um, and I'm not going to even ask for that one up here because it's not the right one. But 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7. God is opposed to the proud. Obviously, that was Satan's problem. God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves. Under the mighty hand of God, humble yourselves. Casting all your anxiety, all your worries, all your problems on him. God's a big God. We don't have to worry about overloading him. Cast all those things on him. Why? Because he cares for you. He loves you so much. And he is in the details of all of our lives. So don't be afraid to reach out to God. The Bible tells us that when we cry out to him, he hears us and will answer us. Okay? So don't be afraid to cry out to God. Use that because... He's your father. He loves you to pieces. He, he just thinks the world of you, and he wants you to be with him forever, not just there. We're going to get there. But right now, Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So hopefully this helps. Go out and have a great Father's Day, and uh, just enjoy yourselves. It's hot out there. Wear a hat. Fathers like to be asked advice. We also like to give it. And that was great advice today, Pastor Tom. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Amen. Well, now we have a, a young father, and he's going to 
bring a short word to us as well. Uh, we love this young man, and uh, he sets a great example. I see him behind the curtains. I watch him as a husband. I watch him as a dad, and I am very, very proud of him. And I am thrilled that he is my son, albeit by marriage, I've decided he is my son, period. And uh, uh, we just love the way he, together with the worship team, leads us in worship. Pastor Steve, happy Father's Day, and give us some advice. Check one, two, there we go, okay, I'm on. All right, I'm just going to sit here and just make you all jump for 15 minutes, so see how loud I can get. Um, well, you know, it's, it's a short time, so I'm going to get straight to it, because I, I could literally spend 15 minutes just thanking you, but I think Robbie said all the right words, so it's, it's, it's done. Uh, we'll talk later, okay, yeah. Pastor Rob? But, but, you know, thank you, Pastor Rob, and to all of the uh, father pastors in this church, Pastor Tom, Pastor Carlos, we love you. Um, thank you for the examples that you set in this house. Um, my sermon, I'm going to get right into it. My sermon is titled, Dry Ground in a Flood Stage. Dry Ground in a Flood Stage. And we're going to get right into it. Moses had passed away, and God is raising up Joshua to lead Israel into the promised land. Okay, Israel has been waiting and waiting and waiting by the river Jordan, waiting to go into what God has promised them, but they couldn't. They couldn't because Moses was not the man to lead them anymore. But Moses had passed away, and, and they were going into a new phase. And this is God talking to Joshua. In Joshua 1, verse 2 through 6, the Lord is speaking to Joshua, says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people, get ready. Someone say, get ready in this place. Get ready. Okay, now just the men, get ready. Get ready. Come on, like at 6 p.m. and your wife's still doing makeup at 5.55. Come on, get ready. Get ready. Okay, okay. Get ready to cross the river Jordan into the land I am about to give them, the Israelites. I will give you every place that you set your feet, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the Euphrates to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you. Pastor Rob, how would you feel if God's voice came out and said that about you? Rob, nobody will stand against you. Would you have a little confidence? Would you have a little? I would. All the days of your life, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. What do you guys think of this word? What do you guys think of this word? And you know what, Joshua, no pressure. No pressure. Moses, what, Moses wasn't the, he couldn't do it. Moses, of all people, couldn't do it, but I've called you. I've called you, Joshua. Israel is about to move to a new stage, to a new promise of his life, but first, Joshua has to address three tribes. There are three tribes that had already taken their promise. There are three tribes that had already taken land under the reign of Moses on the west side, on the other side. Is it the west side? On the other side, <laughs> the, 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 the west side, they had already taken their land. They had already taken their inheritance, okay? And Moses was afraid. Moses was afraid that they would take their inheritance, but they wouldn't cross with the rest of the Israelites to fight so that the rest of the tribes could inherit their promise. He was afraid, and he made them promise, when we go across, you're coming with us. You're coming with us. Because he knew there were 40,000 strong, strong, mighty warriors and strong, mighty men. So, you know, it, it makes me realize that just because God promises you something doesn't mean that you may not need to fight for it. I'm going to say it again. Only like three of you really heard what I'm saying. God may have promised you something, but it doesn't mean that you might not need to fight for it. I'll make it even easier. You might need to fight for your promise. You might need to fight for your promise. 
40,000 military men already enjoying their inheritance, it would have been easy for them to say, you all go on without us. There's no reason for me to leave my wife and my children and to go risk my lives for my brothers. But they went on to say, these 40,000 men, they went on to say, whatever, Joshua, whatever you have commanded us to do, we will do. And wherever you send us, we will go. Pastor Rob, what could you do with 40,000 men with that kind of attitude in the spirit? What, what kind of things could we do in Tampa Bay? But you know what? We don't need 40,000 men right now. I'm believing God for 12 today. I'm believing God for 12 today, whether it's in this room or on the stream. I'm believing God for 12 today. So verse, verse 14, so when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage. Somebody say flood stage. Flood stage. This river is at flood stage. What is God thinking? This is the absolute worst time to try to cross a river. This is the worst time to cross a river. And I could, I could see myself, and I could have seen Joshua saying, God, this clearly is not the time. We're going to wait till after the harvest. And when the rivers are more narrow, it'll be easier for you, God. As if God breaks a sweat to do any of this. As if he breaks a sweat to do any of this. I just want to ask you for a moment, have you ever been, has your, ever, has your life ever been in a flood state? Maybe even right now you've experienced the flood stage. But I feel, just reading this scripture, I feel God is calling you and speaking to you right now that you know what? You don't wait to get out of your flood stage because it's an excuse. You go through it now. You go through it now. He has called you to go through it now. Now, in the, Jor the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests... Do we have the scripture? Yet as soon as the priest carried the ark, and the ark reached the Jordan, and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. Now, you know what? God had done this for them before. God had done this for them before in the Red Sea, a much larger river, okay, a much larger body of water. God had done this for them before, and right now as their feet touch the water, the water starts rolling back. The scripture says, it piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam. Someone say Adam. Someone say Adam. You know, it, it, it's almost 20 miles, I think, in, I think most people, when you, when you picture, especially because of these older <laughs> movies that we've, that we've seen, and, and thank God for those movies, but they were done in a certain way, okay? Uh, but you see people two by two, and that you take a long time to get two million people to cross anything going two by two. So yes, some space was necessary. God said, you can't get within 2,000 cubits of the ark. Yeah, I think that's close to 3,000 feet that they had to stay away from this ark because it was too holy. They couldn't get close to it. They needed some space to get around. Listen to this. The water stopped flowing. It piled up a great distance away. Adam, while the water flowing down to the Dead Sea was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite of Jericho. The priests carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord. They stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground. On dry ground. You know, uh, God does not hesitate to do things at a time of your life when it looks the most difficult because it will make it very clear that it was God in the moment, right? He'll make it very clear that it was God in the moment because you know what? They walked to the deepest part, you know, the middle of the river, that's the deepest part. If it was just if it was just a dam that was created, you know that would have been mud. But no, this was the hand of God. They stood in a dry place while all of Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. Somebody give him praise. Come on, somebody give him praise. Think of any miracle in your life and think of the breakthrough that you received, okay? I am guessing in many of you, in many of your life, that breakthrough did not come immediately. The breakthrough did not come immediately. And you know what? So, sometimes, sometimes that is God waiting. Sometimes that is God waiting for that flood stage in your life so that he can be glorified. Sometimes 
It's because we have waited to exhaust our own strength before calling on the name of the Lord. And you know, it reminds me, it does, it reminds me of my own story, of my own daughter. And I know I mention this many times when I get up here, and that's not what I'm going to be preaching on today. But if you guys remember, because many of you have heard this story, when, when we were celebrating the life of my newborn, firstborn, my baby girl, my princess, Ella, when we were celebrating her life and we were in our promised land, enjoying the moment, enjoying the inheritance that God had given us, a doctor walked into the room and the doctor said that she is failing, that there is no oxygen going into her, so we've put her on our, put her on our machine. And it wasn't good enough, so we've put her on our best machines. And then we took those best machines and we started cranking up the settings and they won't go any further, so there's nothing that is left to do. Now, if he had come and said, but she's okay now, and it was God, I, wouldn't, I would not have known enough that it was God to be still giving this testimony today. You know what? I had to go through a flood stage. I had to go through a flood stage to the point, to the point that they could not detect oxygen in her blood to the point where even the doctor, as she's writing out Ella's medical records, 300 pages long, she wrote, and it is undeniable. The parents are praying by the bedside. There is nothing left that we can do but God. Church, but God. And I just want to encourage you today, if you're in a flood stage, but God. But God, call on the name of the Lord and do not delay. Do not delay. Listen to this. Listen to this. As God commanded, Joshua called together 12 men. God commanded him, gather 12 men. He had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. This is, where, this is where the ark was. This is where the priests are holding it. Twelve men called back. Twelve men called back. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes to the Israelites, to serve as a sign among you. He called twelve strong men. Now, guys, listen. Do you know who these men were? These guys were men who knew how to carry stones because they had learned it from their fathers and their father's father and their father's father's father. These men were, were once, their fathers and their grandfathers were once slaves in Israel, uh, slaves in Egypt, and they were made to carry large stones. These men knew how to carry large stones. And you know what? Back then, they didn't have cable television. Back then, they didn't have social media. So I can just imagine if I called 12 of you all strong men in this place and had 2 million people watching you, I wonder what kind of stone you would choose. <laughs> I'm thinking of Joe right here. You know, Joe, Joe I know everyone's been picking on you today, uh, but Joe has a special anointing. Uh, a special calling. Joe can move. It's like a Samson type of a thing going on with you, Joe. Everyone knows it that knows you. Joe has the ability to move some pretty large things. That's, that's something that he's been called to do. Joe, I'm pretty sure you can bench press like a million pounds, okay? Imagine 12 Joes being called in front of 2 million people to pick a stone that will represent your family for years to come. You're going to pick a, a real big stone, I, I tell you that. And you know what? That stone is not, is not going to look the same as the stones that have been on dry land. So you know a stone that has been in the middle of a river has been washed and washed and washed and washed. And it is going to look very strange to see 12 large beautifully smooth stones in the middle of dry land, it's going to cause some questions to be asked. And it, it goes on to say right here that in the future, the scripture goes on to say to those 12 men, in the future, when your children, I think you all know where I'm going with this, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord when it crossed the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan were cut off, and these stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever, forever. God called 12 men to go back. 
God called 12 men to go back. And I feel strongly that even in this short amount of time that there are 12 men hearing me today. And God is calling you to go back. God is calling you to go back to your Jordan. God is calling you to go back to your testimony. God is calling you back to be a leader of your family. And you know what? Even people watching online right now, men, maybe God is even calling you back into the church. Maybe God is calling you back into a calling. And I just want to put this on you just right now, just for a moment, because you know what? I am not going to let the influencers of this world be the ones to influence my daughter. I'm not going to let YouTube. I'm not going to let TikTok. I'm not going to let Instagram. I'm not going to let these people be the one that speak into the life of my children. But I am going back to pick up a stone so that when my children in my own household ask, Dad, why do you say that? Dad, why do you do that? Dad, why do you do this like this? I can have a testimony to go back. You know what? It goes on to say, Joshua and, and the tribe and the, and the 12 tribes of Israel conquered many, 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 many cities. And, and sometimes they were outnumbered, but they conquered these and every single time. You know what they did? They stacked stones. They stacked stones. And when their children were traveling, anytime they were traveling from point A to point B, they got to know a pile of stones there, and a pile of stones there, and a pile of stones there. And you know what? If you make a left at that one, it brings me back home. The Bible says that when you raise up a child in his ways, that he will not depart. In your, what stones? Man, what stones are you piling up in your household today? What stones are you putting up? What signs have you pulled out from the Jordan so that if your children get lost, that they can make that left, that, that they can make that right, and they can make their way back home? Because if you've set nothing, if you've set no foundation for your children, then when they're lost, they're lost. They will have no way back home. I'm challenging you in this short time. I'm challenging you this morning to start picking up those stones. I'm challenging you this morning, 12 men, go back. Go back. Pick up those stones. Put them in your household so that your children will know that the Lord has brought you through that moment. That the Lord truly brought you through the flood stage. And you know what? He can do it again. He can do it again. He can do it again. And I'm not talking about men. I'm not talking about only the big stones. I'm not talking about only the big stones. The, the little stones sometimes can be just as powerful. You know what? It's not just about testimonies of what God's been, of what he's brought you through. But each one of these stones is a testimony. Okay? Each one of these stones is a testimony. Each one of these stones is an inheritance for your children. And you know what, men? We don't wait till we die to give an inheritance to our family. But in the spirit, the inheritance is now. Say it with me. In the spirit, the inheritance is now. One more time. In the spirit, the inheritance is now. Men, women, anyone in this room. And I'm not talking if you have children, but I'm calling you to the next generation right now. It's not just if you have children. Because you know what? Some of you don't have children yet. All right? Michael, I don't think you're in this room. Michael, you're in this room. Just this morning, just this morning, my two-year-old, she got a new costume. My wife bought her a new costume, okay? She is, um, I don't even know, another princess, okay? I'm going to mess it up if I say it, okay? She's another princess. She's two years old. We surprised her with a costume. She's been wearing this costume nonstop. And you know what she said this morning? I want to bring my costume to church. I want Mr. Michael to see my costume. You know what? You might not be a father yet, but you can speak into the next generation. You can speak into the ne next generation and they can look up to you, okay? So I'm saying this right now, big stones, little stones, some of these stones might be quality time with your children. Uh, you guys know the five love languages? They're not just for your wife. They're for your children as well. 
Quality time with your children is very important. Words of affirmation with your children is very important. Giving gifts to your children is very important. Laying up these stones and these foundations for your children is very important. And you know what? They might be sick of seeing those same stones all the time, and that's how you know that you're doing it right. That's how you know that you're doing it right, because it's st stuck so in, their, in your head. You know, when you're, when you're on a band or when you're learning music, you know that you've learned the song when you're sick of hearing it, okay? That means it's there and it's not going away. So if, you, if your children are starting to act annoyed because you keep talking about the same testimony, if your children start getting annoyed because you keep telling them you love them so many times, that's how you know that you're doing it right. I called my son over. I said, Judah, come here, I want to tell you something. He goes, oh. <sighs> Dad, are you going to tell me you love me again? That's how you know you're doing it right, man. That's how you know you're doing it right. I'm calling you to annoy your children so that it's stuck in there, so that they know that those stones are laid as a foundation in their lives. Men, 12 of you, I'm calling you now. I'm calling you now. I'm calling you out. Quality time. I just want to show you guys a picture. Guys, this was one of the biggest stones in my life right here. This is one of the biggest stones in my life right now. This picture means so much to me. But my dad, he worked hard. He worked hard. You can see how he's dressed. He worked hard. He worked in a machine shop at Dartmouth College. His dad worked at the machine shop at Dartmouth College. I, as a kid, dreamt that I could work at the machine shop at Dartmouth College. It was going to be my calling. This man would come home exhausted. I mean exhausted. And you know what? I would have my fishing pole ready. And he didn't even hesitate. I would have a deck of cards ready. I would have a basketball ready. And he didn't hesitate to, to invest a stone into my life of quality time. And you know what? He did it so much. He did it so much that when he had to come to me with correction, I took it because I knew he loved me. I listened to him because I knew he loved me. I knew that this wasn't coming from a place of hatred or a place that I'm not good enough. Or I knew it because my father loved me. My father loved me. Fathers, what stones are you laying up? in your son's and your daughter's life. I call it right now in the name of Jesus, and I'm going to pray over it right now. Lord God, we're going back. Twelve men, Lord, we're going back. We're getting those stones, Lord, and we're making the decision today because it's never too late. It's never too late to invest into this next generation. Lord God, we give this next generation to you because we know that it will only be a faithless generation if we're not investing faith into them. Lord, we give it to you, Lord Jesus. Let us men, let us women, let us sons and daughters be your hands and your feet, Lord God, to invest in the next generation. We are not, Lord, so self-centered that we think, Lord God, that when we pass away, Lord, that your work is done, Lord Jesus. But when we pass away, Lord God, we hand the mantle down in the name of Jesus. We pray, Lord God, right now, Lord Jesus, that 12 men would go back in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Come on, give him some praise this morning. Praise God. Two awesome preachers. That's tremendous. I think every man could stand up and go, hoo, 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 right now. We've just been charged up. Uh, great words, great teaching, great preaching. Pastor Tom, thank you. That was awesome. And uh, Pastor Steve, thank you. Can we stand, please? You know, honor starts in the house of the Lord. If we can't give him honor, we won't give others honor. And far be it that we give honor to anything in the world more than we give to our heavenly father. Amen.
If you have never asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart, there is one way to have relationship with God as a loving dad, and that is to accept his most perfect gift, Jesus dying on the cross. You know what I got for all of my mistakes? You know what I got for all the things I did wrong? He loved me by coming and dying on a cross. That's what I got for all the stupid moments of my life. repaid me by giving up his life so that I could have a better life. Amen. If you have never asked Jesus in your heart or if you've walked away from the Lord before we leave this morning, every eye closed. But if you want a relationship with God on a personal level, then accept Jesus Christ as God's gift to bridge the gap between you and Him. How many of you this morning want to ask Christ into your heart and have a relationship with God? Come on. Thank you. I see that hand. God bless you. Who else? Raise your hand across this auditorium as the Holy Spirit is speaking. Thank you, sir. I see that hand. God bless you. You can put your hands down. Who else? I know God is talking to people today, men and women. My life wouldn't be what it is if it wasn't for a relationship with God through Jesus. And because of that, it has affected every relationship in my life. Yes, absolutely. Amen. Before we close, just one more time. Men, women, if you need to accept Jesus, come on, raise your hand. Right now, two men have already raised their hand to say yes to Jesus Christ. I think that's awesome. That's awesome. Ladies, if that's you, say yes and accept Christ as your Savior today. Thank you, Jesus. I want everyone to repeat this prayer. And those two men that have raised your hands especially, repeat this prayer with me. And we're going to invite Jesus in our heart. And I'll tell you, I'd like the two of you, when once the service is over, come down the front, say hello to me. I want to pray with you. I want to shake your hand. Would you do that? Awesome. I want everyone to pray this prayer right now. Dear God, thank you for being the kind of dad that I need, for loving me even when I messed up. Jesus Christ. I accept you into my life to be my Lord and my Savior. I've messed up, but I thank you, Jesus, that you're willing to forgive me, accept me, identify with me, and live inside of me. Come and live in me, Jesus. I receive you today as my Lord and my Savior. Thank you, Father, for accepting me today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Two people raised their hand today. What do you think of that? Amen. We're proud of you. We're proud of you.